Okay, we're back again. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, this is British and American Culture. Hello again. This is going to be the second part of our lecture this week. Um, <clears throat> the title is Origins of the Peoples of the Isles, the British Isles. Uh, sorry about the lighting if it's not that good. As you can see, we don't have a real studio here. This is just my office. I turn the back lights off to try and spotlight um, <clears throat> the board, but it's not working that great. Anyway, all we have to do is get through the second half of this lecture and uh, we can finish off chapter one, which will be the first time, I think, since uh, five or six years ago that I managed to do this. So I'm proud of myself. What we're going to do today <clears throat> is we're going to take... Uh, the people that we talked about, the Celts, the Romans, the Germans, and the Vikings. You know they have interchangeable names here. I People are usually, they're Germanic. Um, the particular names are not important, especially the Jutes. And, you know, the biggest group is usually the Danes. Uh, that's why the northern part of England and Scotland was called the Dane Law. But now what I need to do is um, talk to you about people because... I think the most interesting thing about history is learning about the individuals. And so far, I've only really talked about Julius Caesar, <clears throat> which uh, he's not British. Um, obviously, he is somebody that Western, you know, politicians, um, generals, intellectuals, <clears throat> uh, all sorts of people uh, in Western culture have uh, emulated or had respect for for a variety of reasons. Um, we, he did write down uh, about his exploits, so we, we can read uh, his own writing, which is really fascinating stuff. I can't read Latin, but I read the English. But anyway, enough about Caesar. We're going to move forward. Caesar was a Roman. Um, <clears throat> what we're interested in is people that are actually could be considered British. Um, all of these people mixed together will eventually produce something called a British person, right? But none of these people are British. Um, we're going to start with Boudicca because she was uh, Britain, she, the spelling B-R-I-T-O-N. But I'm going to call her, you know, Celtic because I just don't want you to get confused with me saying British, Britain, Britannia, and so on. Okay, so she is she is a, a Briton. She's a she's a from a tribe um, that is living in Britannia, which they don't call themselves that. Remember, this is the Roman name. So the Romans called them Britons, and the Romans call themselves Romans, of course. And they call this this province they create, which roughly corresponds to the the, the lower half of England today. Um, they call it Britannia. Boudicca was a queen. Uh, of one of those tribes and as the Romans divided the tribes uh, some tribes decided decided to fight some decided to meet, remain neutral and some decided to help the Romans and so they took over everyone and basically the way it worked is uh, if you were a friendly tribe you would keep control of your territory if you were the king and you were friendly to the to the Romans. You would keep control of your territory until you died or in special cases until uh, you had no sons. And then the uh, territory of the tribe would go over to the Romans. Um, until then, you were kind of like a subjugate um, you know, colony of the Romans. So they had control over your territory, but you had uh, the power over the people that were living there. So this is the relationship that many of the tribes had, including Boudicca and her husband. Uh, her husband died, <clears throat> and uh, the Romans got a little bit ahead of themselves. And by a little bit, I mean way ahead of themselves. They attacked her and raped her, sexually assaulted uh, her daughters. And um, this was all unprovoked, essentially the territory and the tribe were going to go become under the power of the Romans anyway. It was just Romans getting greedy and soldiers wanting power and taking advantage of other people. 
um, as imperial, you know, imperial militaries do. Um, they don't treat the people fairly. So they, even though they were promised uh, fair treatment, uh, they got treated, uh, you know, insulted, assaulted, and um, some of them killed. So Boudicca raised a revolt. She gathered together some tribes that had also been mistreated by the Romans, and they, you know, um, gathered a large group of, of warriors, and they killed as many Romans as they could. They just went on a rampage, uh, and they, they killed a huge, huge number of Roman soldiers and citizens, and it took, it took the Roman legion, which this is thousands of Roman soldiers uh, from, from Londinium, to be led by a general and centurions to uh, put down the revolt. And of course, Boudicca was executed and all, every, every Briton, every Celtic person they could get their hands on, the Romans killed. So tragic ending, but Boudicca is remembered. And you can see in the textbook, the statue of Queen Boudicca. There's various spellings, by the way. Um, I'm spelling it with two C's there. In the book, it's spelled with one C, but I think there's three different spellings. Um, it says in the book, the statue of Queen Boudicca, which was designed by Thomas Thorncroft, next to the Parliament buildings in Westminster, London, United Kingdom. This is right beside the, the um, station, the subway station to the underground, to the London Underground. So you can, if you go to London, you can see um, she doesn't look... <laughs> She doesn't look Celtic at all. We're going to talk about this a lot. How all British heroes tend to look similar. So even though Boudicca obviously was a um, Britonic um, warrior queen, uh, she's riding a chariot with a horse and she looks like some sort of Greek or Roman style uh, goddess. Okay. It's a very interesting statue though. And the point I wanna make here is she's the original female role model, the independent um, woman who takes action and has power. Uh, and is even though she did lose her life in the process, she's willing to be independent and fight um, for equality and justice. Um, there are various um, Korean women also um, who are well known for fighting um, for independence during the Japanese uh, occupation, even though they were thrown in jail or they were killed or tortured or assaulted, uh, they fought anyway, and they're, we remember them as heroes. So Queen Boudicca, all the way back uh, 2,000 years ago, she's the first British that we know of. Um, she's the first British female hero. So I chose to talk about her first. Although I did talk about Julius Caesar, she's the first British one. Again, nothing's British yet. She's a Briton. She's a Celt. Um, she doesn't know that Britain's going to exist. Nobody does yet. Second, <clears throat> let's do Arthur. Everybody knows King Arthur, uh, or you should know because you know that this is one of the most famous English myths. And if you don't know this one, I don't know how you know the other ones. So. Uh, King Arthur, the legend of King Arthur is that uh, when he was a boy, uh, his father, Uther Pendragon, you know, had him raised by a knight. And then when he came of age, he was supposed to become the king of England and, <clears throat> and lead uh, the court at Camelot. Uh, there's a sword, magical sword, that is given by the Lady of the Lake to a famous wizard named Merlin. Merlin is like basically Dumbledore or Dumbledore from Harry Potter, or you might, if you like Lord of the Rings, uh, he looks kind of like Gandalf. So he's the original wizard, like all the Western, you know, wizard Mabopsa stories. Um, they all have a old man wizard who's like 1000 years old and he's really wise and knows all these magic tricks. That's Merlin. Merlin's the original, um, and he, perhaps not the original, but he's, he is the one that we have in literature, and he takes this sword called Excalibur, and from this magical woman in the lake, 
She hands him the sword, he sh puts it into a stone, and the only person who can pull the stone, uh, sorry, the only person who can pull the sword out of the stone is the person who's destined to be the king of England and save the land, right? Um, so when Arthur gets to be a, like a teenager, all these really powerful, famous knights try to pull it out of the stone. Nobody can do it, and then Arthur pulls it out. That's how the story goes, and he becomes king. Um, this, all of this, is written mostly in French, actually. Of course, um, f French was a much more influential language um, a thousand years ago when the tale of Arthur was written. But the most important thing I want you to know about Arthur is he's not real. We don't really know that much <clears throat> about the tale of King Arthur. And uh, I don't believe at this part, I say very much about him in the book. When you read along, you'll see, uh, we get into King Alfred right away after Boudicca, but I, I wanna talk about Arthur right now because of the timeline. Supposedly, Arthur lived <clears throat> and was a Romano Briton. This is very confusing because he's fighting against the enemies are the Angles and the, and the Saxons and the Jutes. He's fighting against the Germanic people and he's supposed to be uh, a Romano Briton. So he's a Romanized Celt. The real person, if he existed, was not Anglo-Saxon. So the story doesn't really make sense, does it? <clears throat> because he's supposed to be an English hero, but he's fighting against the English. Don't ask me, this is how the story gets put together. But basically, it's written in French. It's, it's about a legendary figure who defended the Romano Britons against the invasion of the Germanic people. And eventually, you know, they were overcome. But he, he stops the invasion uh, and the darkness of, of the new dominant culture temporarily. And for that, he's, he's um, immortalized. Uh, so we haven't really found any evidence of a real King Arthur, but he gets used by the Anglo-Saxons themselves as the ideal type king. And then he gets used by Vikings and Norse and Normans. And then he gets used by, eventually he becomes like a sort of universal symbol of British uh, monarchy. Right, so we'll get to it later in the medieval period when there's famous warrior kings and they're imitating Arthur, they're imitating his, you know, the, not imitating the real Arthur, imitating the character in the book. The kings of England tried to be like Arthur. Henry VIII is gonna name his firstborn child Arthur. And uh, Richard the Lionheart is going to go to the Holy Land with a sword which he names Excalibur. Right, so this, these legends, the legend of King Arthur becomes almost real um, because uh, the kings of England imitate the character, they imitate the persona that is created. So then down through the ages, it becomes the most important symbol of uh, British, you know, kingship and power. So that brings us to Alfred the Great, who is a real person and he is an Anglo-Saxon. Now, <clears throat> don't be confused again. Arthur fought against his ancestors, if he existed. Alfred has no connection to Arthur. It's not gonna be until after the Vikings that the story of Arthur is created and added to, and it's gonna be written in French anyway. So Alfred the Great, he's a real person. He is, <clears throat> he's an Anglo-Saxon king. The most important thing about him is, as I told you, there was um, not just one uh, Angle or Saxon kingdom, there were seven. There was one Jute kingdom, there were three Saxon kingdoms and three Angle kingdoms. The Northern kingdoms were mostly occupied by the Angles and all of them were overrun. They were stronger initially. Uh, you don't need to remember the names, but uh, there is, <clears throat> I am going to introduce to you uh, next class, not yet, but I'm gonna introduce to you some PPT slides. And uh, the PPT slides will show to you um, some maps and some pictures. And uh, there's some writing that I did on the slides too, 
but uh, the book is a much better resource, so we'll stick to that. But the pictures are good to look at um, on the slides because they give you an idea of what I'm talking about. But basically, England was divided into seven parts. All of them were taken over by Vikings. So we're getting down here, we're getting close to 800. Um, the, the Vikings have already started to take over. They're already the more dominant um, power. It is Alfred that is the turning point after the Vikings start to take over the entire country. He's the one who stops it. If Alfred did not exist, it's likely that, I don't know what it will, it's a counterfactual. I can't say it's likely. There was a possibility that English wouldn't exist. I wouldn't be speaking English. I would be speaking Danish, okay? Or maybe something else would have happened. Who knows? But Alfred was the one who prevented the Vikings from controlling the entire um, island, okay? They had control of Scotland, all the other six kingdoms. There was only one kingdom left in the middle and the south. It was called Wessex, okay? They're pretty easy to remember. Uh, Wessex, Sussex, Essex. There's the West Saxons, the South Saxons, the East Saxons. So he's the king of Wessex and everything else is gone. Um, at one point, he's completely uh, surrounded by Viking forces and he's lost his army and he's lost everything except for, you know, some clothes, some food and, and his weapon. Uh, so nobody even realizes he's a king. So this is, this is, there's a great little anecdote here in the book, and I'm going to read it. I don't read from my book very often, but this is a great little story. <clears throat> uh, it comes from uh, Lacey Baldwin Smith's book on English history made brief, irreverent, and pleasurable. So this is an anecdote. It's not a true story. Alfred is a real person, <clears throat> but this likely didn't happen. But this story is told... Um, in order for people to understand Alfred's character. So, legend has it that in, eight, in 878, right, right down here, 878, at the low point in his efforts to save the kingdom from the destruction by the Vikings, Alfred was forced into hiding and wandered with a small band of men through the woods and fen and fastness of Somerset. Separated from his soldiers, he stumbled upon a swineherd's hut, that's somebody who, it's a person, farmer, who has pigs, a pig farmer. Where in Christian charity, he was given food and shelter for several days by a husband and wife who had no notion who, who he was. So basically, he's staying with a pig farmer with a nice, uh, pig farmer and his wife who are being nice and giving him some food and shelter, even though he looks like a beggar. One day while Alfred sat in front of the fire, the wife began to bake bread, expecting him to keep an eye on the loaves. So she's baking bread and she's expecting him to make sure that the bread doesn't burn. <clears throat> um, he was deep, but he was deeply depressed and trying to console himself. So he was meditating, kind of praying on the patience of Job in the face of divine affliction and praying to St. Neot to intercede. So he's just praying, come on, I need some sign here that I can recover my kingdom. And while he was doing that, he forgot about the bread and he let them burn. So the wife turned around and yelled at him, you fail to turn the loaves while you see them burning, yet you're quite happy to eat them when they come warm from the oven. So you'll eat the bread, but you won't watch them while they're burning. You're a irresponsible beggar. <clears throat> now he's actually the king. So, but instead of uh, getting angry and saying, how dare you talk to me like this, you pig farmer's wife he says he he is chased chastised for his negligence and humbly directed his attention to the unkingly task of watching the bread so the story is about how uh, about his humility like how he's humble he does, he's not proud and he doesn't uh, needlessly get angry um, he's not that type of person he's uh, he's a very devout he's a very religious um, person he's very confident um, he's not very healthy. <clears throat> One of the things about Alfred is his in, entire life is he's got some, some sort of disease. So he's constantly, um, in trouble digestively. Like he has to go to the bathroom and he's, he's got pains in his stomach and his, uh, intestines all the time. So he's, he's not a very strong person and he had older brothers. 
So he wasn't supposed to be alive, probably. This is, there's no like special medicine. There's no hospitals. There's no real doctors. Um, you can just kind of hope that your body recovers and eat healthy. But he had the problem his entire life. So uh, it's ironic that he survived and his healthier brothers did not. But in retrospect, the Anglo-Saxons were lucky that the, the fourth um, child survived. He actually went all the way to Rome on a pilgrimage and he met the Pope and got the blessing of the Pope. He came back to England. The Vikings took over all of the surrounding kingdoms and almost took over his kingdom. And then supposedly he, he uh, you know, was hiding in the swamp and then staged a huge comeback and recovered Wessex. And then he started conquering um, back towards London. And him and uh, his sons and his grandsons will start to retake all of England uh, back from the Vikings. And that will create England. Alfred is kind of the father of England because it shrank down to almost nothing. And then from his effort, it started to grow again. And then when it recovered uh, the other kingdoms, there was not seven kingdoms anymore. The Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were unified under one king. The first one was Alfred. Okay, so he's the first in the line of Anglo-Saxon kings that rule over Angeland, the kingdom of the Angles, which will become the country of England eventually. Alfred, you could compare Alfred to Sejong the Great. He is a, a skilled military leader. He is uh, he's able to read and write. He's literate. He um, <clears throat> he knows about philosophy and religion. Uh, he changes the administration. He he uh, does a census, so he can, he can tax people better. He tries to build a navy. He cultivates the art. He's basically, that's why you call him Alfred the Great, because he's like, you know, Sejong Dewan. He's, he, he did everything well. Um, of course, he wasn't perfect. Um, his health problems was one of those things, but um, he's, a, he's an ideal leader. And he gets, can, he was, you know, later uh, recovered as, you know, a, in, hundreds of years later, when England reasserts itself as a, as a country and English uh, culture starts to grow and become more popular, he sort of gets recovered as one of the original heroes of the English kingdom. So that's Alfred the Great. You can't forget about him. He saved, saved uh, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms from the Vikings, and he also reformed the state um, improved the military, improved taxation. Um, he was honest, he was pious, he went to church, he was religious. He basically had all the best qualities. He, it's, you have to wonder if he was actually that good because it sounds too good to be true. You know what presidents are like, you know what kings are really like. Nobody's that perfect. Even Sejong, I'm sorry to say, Sejong probably had a few character flaws uh, that we forgot about because you know, we try to look them, make them look as good as we can. All right, <clears throat> so there's Alfred. He, he's our Anglo-Saxon. We've also got Canute. Canute, as the name suggests, Canute is a, a, a Viking. He's really also, he's also called Canute the Great, but for a different reason, mostly because he was a Danish king. And when the Anglo-Saxon, um, there was no Anglo-Saxon princes to, to take over the kingdom, um, he he offered himself as a candidate and basically without there was constant fighting between the Danes and the English but the Anglo-Saxons not English yet um, they they basically didn't have all-out war at, at any point they were sort of constantly you know fighting each other in in battles and skirmishes but the lines didn't move very much so when there was no leadership for the Anglo-Saxon side, there was already kind of a relationship, a cultural exchange going on. And um, they decided that Canute would be the best King of England. So he became King of Denmark, King of Scotland, King of, <clears throat> basically he was King of the British Isles, Sweden, Denmark, Norway. He was King of all of this. 
And so for just just him though, and, and it took his personality and, and his ability in order to make this happen. And as soon as he died, uh, it split up again <clears throat> uh, amongst uh, other, you know, other possible princes and his, his own sons. So briefly, we had this thing called the, the North Sea Empire. And you can read about Canute uh, near the end of the chapter <clears throat> where I posted a picture, a picture of a ruin of a Viking church uh, in Orkney Island, right? Like I mentioned in the previous lecture, somewhere I, it's one of my bucket list destinations to go to Northern Scotland. Um, so it tells you around 1000 AD, that's when Canute uh, became this great leader who was the king of Denmark and the king of the United Kingdom, the king of the Nordic countries and the king of the, the British Isles at the same time, which would never happen again. It's only happened once, and that's why he's Canute the Great. Um, now, to close this lecture without making it too long, I'm shooting for 30 minutes here. Here's another cultural question. <clears throat> it goes along with all this stuff. What makes these people, since they are all from different places, once they get you know, onto this aisle, what's another thing that makes them, you know, gel? What makes them who they are? Well, some people think that if you are a person who lives in an island, you have a certain type of culture. Um, and I sometimes agree with that. And sometimes you can see how it makes sense sometimes, but you've got different types of islands. You, the Japanese island and, the, and New Zealand and the British Isles are the three largest uh, islands in the world, right? That are, are, that we can live in and have, have climates that are good for humans to live. Are these people similar? The people that live in New Zealand and the people that, well, the people in New Zealand came from uh, the United Kingdom. So yes, they are. But, you know, the Maori are not. The original people from New Zealand are not very similar to, to the British at all. The Japanese are in some ways similar, but that's because of cultural exchange, not because the Japanese were naturally or geographically um, developing into an you know, island type, you know, civilization. Nonetheless, though, you get this kind of, you know, insular kind of feel. Uh, no matter what the particular characteristics are, is that they're kind of protective. But, but you can also see how the British might, and the English might be, start to get a little bit protective when every few hundred years, their entire you know, territory gets turned over and dominated by a new group of people. Um, that these, it, we still have all the evidence in language and in culture and in archaeology and in genetics of what happened. So by 1000 AD, <clears throat> there's going to be a, a large final takeover um, in 1066, which we're going to talk about before we do the quiz. But <clears throat> suffice to say, this has caused some paranoia, um, of an interest in being isolated or naturally isolated, xenophobia, fear of other people, of aliens, looking inward and looking and being backward, being different. Is this related to their identity of being an island people or not? It's a good question. I'm not saying it's true. I'm just saying these are ideas that people suggest or talk about. Then you have to add, well, what about how multicultural it is? All this, all this, and then add to the globalization later. And what about the British expanding all over the world? That's not usually what island people do. So there must be something different about the British. If they're expansionistic, and most island people don't do that. What is it? I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll suggest things. This is the funniest, one of the funniest um, anecdotes. One of the funniest things that's been written in the media um, of to do with this island mentality. There was, there was in a newspaper <clears throat> long time ago before any of us were born. This is back uh, in the 20th century that in a newspaper, this, this headline appeared, fog in channel, continent isolated. Nothing wrong with that, right? This is a, there's no grammar mistake or anything. You know what's funny though, is that fog in channel, 
island isolated. Who is isolated? Right? When there's fog between the channel and the English channel, who is isolated? It, it's the island that's isolated. The continent is huge. They're not isolated. They're still connected. But what it says here is fog and channel. The continent is isolated from us. This is the real inward looking attitude. And this is uh, often quoted by people uh, as being an example of British culture being out of touch and like not you are European, thinking that they are uh, important and central. And you can see that in Japanese culture too. The, the isolationist tendency and the, the tendency to look towards themselves and look at other people as being outside, when in fact, Asia is gigantic and Japan is outside of Asia, not the other way around. The same thing goes for the British Isles, but the British Isles are small and they are outside of the continent, not the other way around. Okay, anyway, that'll do for today. Um, thank you for listening to the second part and I look forward to next week's lecture. Um, have a good weekend. Take care.